Missouri River took many by surprise during the spring and summer of 2011. On tonight's season premiere of South Dakota Focus, we'll take a look back at this historic flood. We'll talk about how such a catastrophic event happened on a river that is managed by a federal agency and what is being done to see that it never happens again. That's the historic flood of the Missouri River on tonight's South Dakota Focus, up next. You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Tonight, we look back at the 2011 historic flood of the Missouri River. This past year has been a nightmare for many who live up and down the river. Well, that nightmare is still not over as communities continue to clean up and the cost of this flood continues to rise. Joining us tonight to talk about how the flood unfolded and what assistance might be available, the governor of South Dakota, Dennis Dugard. Thank you, governor, for coming back in tonight. Glad to be here. Also with us, Director Christy Terman with the State Office of Emergency Management, which is within the Department of Public Safety. Welcome back, Christy. Thanks, Stephanie. Glad to be here again. And from the United States Army Corps of Engineers, Deputy District Engineer Ted Streckfuss. Welcome to Public Broadcasting. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. And of course, one of the communities heavily impacted by the flood was Pierre. The mayor of Pierre is also with us tonight, Lori Gill. Welcome, Lori. My pleasure. And of course, thank you all for tuning in tonight. We have been on hiatus for a few months, so just a reminder, South Dakota Focus is live, and over the next hour, we hope to hear from you. So if you have a question or a comment for one of our guests, give us a call or send us an email. Our toll-free phone number is 1-877-825-5788. That's 1-877-TALK-PTV, or our email address is sdfocus at sdpb.org. We have a lot to talk about and some video segments to look at this hour. So we're going to jump right into things. Governor, I'm going to start with you. Okay. How, I guess, really the question is, how does the 2011 flood of the Missouri River compare to any other disasters we've had to deal with in South Dakota? Well, uh, of course, my experience is vast, being governor now for a whopping eight months. but. <laughs> I will say, uh, as a citizen, I've observed most disasters come and go fairly quickly. Certainly, that's the case with tornadoes, uh, flash floods. They come and then they go. Uh, once in a while, we'll have a fair amount of warning, as in the case of, say, a, a heavy snowpack, and we'll know that the Sioux River is going to rise or the James River is going to rise, and we can predict to some degree that we'll have flooding and alert people. But really, there's never been anything like this where we have about 10 days notice, then suddenly the river rises very significantly on the Missouri and then stays up for months. And the time when it will come back down is uncertain mm -hmm. and unknown. And so I would say that created a lot of anxiety at the very beginning, a lot of fear and uncertainty. And then once the river came up, uh, a lot of uh, anxiety uh, that maintained itself for a long period of time as people wondered, when will this end? And then uh, the damages that were caused also changed over time. In the initial stages, it was the high water that in some cases overwhelmed protective measures. In other cases, protective measures were sufficient. But then over time, groundwater started to become a problem. So the, the, uh, the threat changed over time and now here we are in early September and it's finally subsided to a large degree in terms of the river height. But that's, that's really quite a different kind of disaster than we've ever experienced before. Mm -hmm. Christy, you know, I look at the river on the map and it goes vertically down the state of South Dakota and is your job in the emergency management department. I think about how widespread you had to work with communities and people. Had we ever done something on that level where there were so many communities impacted? I think what it, 
the disaster that we could compare it to was probably the November 2005 ice storm where we had 50,000 customers in the eastern part of the state uh, without power, over 150 communities without power. But in that, so, so geographically, we have had something to compare it to, but this is the first one where we had a wide geographic area where the chances of a lot of property damage was very high. I mean, we knew that we were gonna have record flows, water so higher than we've seen it before, and this was gonna destroy property. Um, the ice storm, obviously we had a lot of power lines down, but people didn't lose their homes or businesses. So that really put this up into a different category, and it, it's definitely the most complex disaster we've ever dealt with. Sure. Ted, from uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, it's interesting, has the Corps ever had to deal with such a widespread, because you know, obviously we're live in South Dakota tonight, but this impacted more than just South Dakota. From the Corps' perspective, how, I guess, catastrophic or severe was this in, in your records? It, it's, a, it's a huge event. You contrast it with uh, other flood events, and I think consistently across uh, the, the duration of this event, we've, we've termed it as the flood of 2011. We didn't try to draw parallels with it. Is it like a 97? Is it like a 93? Because each, each one of those events had, had different attributes. Some of them were lower basin flooding. Of, but this one is kind of unique with respect to being across the entire length and breadth of the Missouri River, especially within the Omaha District area responsibility. What is interesting to me or, or provided a, a degree of benefit, if you want to look at it from that perspective, is you know we've had flood fights going on in 2009. We had flood fights in 2010, uh, certainly on the James River up in, from Jamestown all the way down through South Dakota. Um, this year we, we were fighting floods in all or parts of eight states at the same time. So it was a, a huge event uh, with catastrophic consequences. Lori, as uh, the mayor of a community right on the river, I'm curious to know, was there ever the feeling because we had the reservoir system, the dam system in place, that this could never happen? And did you find people in your community shocked that it was happening? Yeah, we've heard a lot about that. Uh, there were a lot of folks that thought because we were living right on that side of the dam, the protected side, if you will, uh, that this was something that couldn't happen. And I think there was that belief. Uh, our community has experienced um, things through the years. In 97, we had a, a bit of flooding in a part of our community, and we were able to put up uh, some infrastructure changes to be able to pump water in a way that we hadn't before. And that really served us well now. But we certainly had never expected that we would be facing the rising Missouri River in this way. Uh, it was something our city uh, was shocked, but yet immediately began working towards preparations when we knew we had to, we were racing against time. Mm -hmm. Governor, I'm going to come back. When we first started to hear that this was an issue, we were going to have flooding, um, those of us, the average South Dakota citizen, you know, we heard different things. It could be the 100-year flood. It could be the 500-year flood. We heard it could be catastrophic in some places, not so much in others. From your perspective, where you were sitting when this first came to your desk, did you have a good point at how severe it could be, or was it ever-changing? I would say it was ever-changing. Um, when I first heard that there would be significantly increased flows. I, I know it was on Tuesday, May 24th, and uh, got an email about it. And uh, then uh, that night, uh, I spoke with, uh, I think it was that night, or the next that I spoke with uh, Colonel Rook at the uh, Omaha District, who confirmed that flows would be uh, possibly as high as 110, maybe even reaching 120 cubic feet per second. Mm -hmm. And to put that in perspective, the previous record release at the um, Oahe Dam was 59,000, so potentially twice as high as the record over the past roughly 50 years. So at that point, I knew it was very significant, but the breadth of the spread was really uncertain, and I didn't know what we would need to do to protect ourselves. And then uh, it was just within days, uh, I think Christy activated the Emergency Operations Center immediately. Uh, we, that weekend, activated the National Guard. 
the Corps led a contract to start building levees uh, on both sides of Pier and Fort Pier. And uh, by Sunday morning, this was again Tuesday night, we found out about it. Wednesday, we activated the operations center. By Sunday morning, construction had begun on the levees. And we knew at that stage already uh, the prediction had changed to uh, flows as high as 150 cubic feet per second. Not 120, which was twice the record, but 150. And so everyone was feeling like, gosh, when's the other shoe going to drop? It's ever changing. And then the inundation maps that we were able to get were really not very helpful in uh, showing how high the water might rise based upon the flows that were were being predicted. And it, you know, the Corps worked hard to give us that eventually. And as soon as we got it, uh, Christy got it on our website and, and we produced maps to show the, the level to which the water would reach, we believed. But it, it was a rapidly evolving situation and there was a lot of second guessing going on. Mm -hmm. Ted, from the perspective of the Corps, some people might wonder why was it ever changing? How come we didn't know from the beginning that so much water would have to come down the river. That's an excellent question, and I have fielded it many times. If you, if you look at this from, from a uh, watershed perspective, you have three components of water that are going to be entering the system. You have the plain snowpack, which is, call it February through May time frame. You have mountain snowpack which is normally going to come in in the Fort Peck and Garrison reaches of the system, and then in conjunction with that you have rainfall. So those three components are what end up coming, that, that we, we project is what's going to come into the system, and based upon our projections, we develop a forecast for what the discharges are going to be. When you take a step back and look at the Oahe, or the, the Missouri River system as a whole, uh, the system is allocated, and I'll start throwing some numbers out, 16.3 million acre feet of flood storage within the Missouri River system. And we have that available on every given year in order to account for those three components of water that are going to be coming into the system. This year on the 28th of January, we were exactly where we needed to be, 16.3 million acre feet. We knew there was a very heavy Plains snowpack, and we accounted for that within our projections and forecast for what the discharges were going to need to be. We knew on the 15th of April that the snowpack in the mountains was trending very close to normal. It was about 110% of what it normally was on the 15th of April, which is also when the snowpack in the mountains normally peaks. Well, this year, again, that's one of those shoes that the governor is talking about. That was one of the shoes that dropped because the snowpack continued to rise after the 15th of April and did not peak until the 2nd of May. And when it did peak, it, it ranged anywhere from 139 to 141% of normal. 141% was in the Fort Peck base and 139% in the Garrison Reach. That we accounted for. We, we looked at the volume of water that would be present within that snow in conjunction with that plain snowpack, in conjunction with what we foresaw as normal rainfall, and based upon that, we established a forecast which still allowed us to be able to evacuate the reservoir system at less than that 59 to 70,000 cubic foot per second flow rates that we had previously done in the past. The Filling of the bathtub, if you will, if you envision the entire system as a large bathtub, occurred right around that 24th of May time frame when we had between 300 and 600 percent of normal rainfall in northeast Wyoming, western North Dakota, and eastern uh, Montana. Um, I just heard yesterday that the volume of water that occurred as a result of that, those rainfall events in late May is actually more than the amount of rain that fell with Hurricane Irene kind of an interesting um, statistic, if you will. But that, in essence, is what took all the flexibility away. When that rain fell, and we then accounted for that rainfall within our models, we knew that we would have to evacuate at a higher rate in order to get that water through the system. So that's, that's kind of the short history of, of why, you know, the Corps of Engineers manages the system on the basis of water on the ground. 
you, you, you don't look two months out in the future and scratch your head and say, is it going to be wet or is it going to be dry? That, that's, I don't think anyone would like the outcomes if we were to do something like that. So on the basis of rain that falls within the system, snow that falls in the mountains and on the plains, we assess the amount of water within that. And when you get these huge rainfall events, you adjust and, and unfortunately we ended up in a situation where we had to uh, have the releases that we did. We're going to talk more about some of those uh, historic or I guess increased releases. They reached historic levels. We'll talk about that later in the hour. In a few minutes we're going to take a look back at how uh, this whole flooding scenario unfolded. But before we go to that video, Christy, just give us an update. Do we still have people that and I know that we do, but give me an idea of how many people do we know that have not been able to move back into their home, may never be able to go back into their homes. I don't have an exact number, Stephanie, but uh, in, in the Pier Fort Pier area, and I think Mayor Gill can probably confirm this, a lot of folks have moved back into their homes. A lot of folks left because of the safety factor. A lot of folks are, uh, there have moved back in. Obviously, some of the um, hardest hit areas, particularly along Frontier Road um, in the Fort Pier area, those are folks that, that aren't back in and they may not ever get back in. Mm -hmm. uh, in Dakota Dunes and the Union County area, again the Riverland area, it, uh, Riverland flooded almost immediately and those folks may not get back in their homes. Uh, I know they're working to allow the residents of Dakota Dunes back into that area. Uh, Jeff Dooley is working really hard to get their, their water and sewer system back up. So we do still have a, a lot of people that are out of their homes. Right. Sad. Well, uh, we're going to have FEMA join us here in just a little bit. But right now, I want to show you a video. Much of the news surrounding this historic flood actually hit the airwaves for the first time around the end of spring. Well, Mother Nature, she was on the job way before that with record amounts of snowfall during the winter, just as you talked about, Ted. It was an historic event, and we do know that the water levels are continuing to go down right now. Cleanup is ongoing, but what we wanted to do is give you a look back at when the flood started and how it kind of worked its way through the summer. Take a look. Running vertically through the middle of South Dakota, the Missouri River is a symbol of beauty and endless recreational opportunities. However, the river took many by surprise in mid-May as water levels in the upper basin reservoirs began to reach record highs. In 2011, the Missouri River system, managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, proved itself to be beyond the control of engineers. This historic flood formed in steps beginning in late winter with blizzard after blizzard followed in the spring by record rainfall. The Corps eventually announced it would begin releasing water from the four dams and warned those downstream that releases could reach record highs. Government officials took to the airwaves, warning citizens of possible catastrophic flooding. Those in the path of the river were encouraged to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Residents along the river envisioned a wall of water destroying everything in sight and quickly began the preparation for a devastating flood. The court delivered deadlines on when they would begin increasing water flows. This gave communities time to build emergency levees, construct walls of sandbags, and move homeowners in the river's path to higher ground. By the first part of June, the Oahe Dam near Pier was the first to see water releases increase. By midsummer, all four South Dakota dams would see record amounts of water.